Back to our news, uh, Marnie, go ahead. Killed Filipino airman honored by Goldberg. Jover Domance, second class airman with the 710th Special Operations Wing of the Philippine Air Force, died April 7 after an accident during a proficiency parachute jump exercise in Subic. Domance fell into the sea instead of landing on a designated zone at the airport as what Captain Celeste Frank Saison, an, an affair of a Balikatan Public Affairs said. The United States Ambassador of the Philippines, Philip Goldberg, honored the Filipino soldier who died. It was held during the 74th commemoration of Araw ng Kagitingan. Goldberg said, We are here today, first and foremost, not only to thank the cor courageous soldiers, who fought in Bataan, but also to appreciate and honor all those who have continued to sacrifice for our freedom. Goldberg, meanwhile, also lauded the participation of Japan as an observer in the current Balikatan exercises. He said that the three nations have developed strong and enduring relationships. The Philippines and Japan are among the United States' most steadfast allies and that they have all continued to work together to strengthen the stability and the security of the entire Pacific region. Okay, so, uh, Hero, uh, wake up. You have coffee already. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a Sunday morning, but uh, what is your reaction? Of course, I have my reaction to this news. Well, again, uh, you know, um, this whole uh, American-Filipino joint exercises, uh, this reminds me of the Cold War days. I mean, those days are gone. Uh, what are we practic practicing for? Defense against an invasion. Against who? Who will invade the Philippines? This whole issue of the Spratlys, the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea dispute is a complicated issue where four or five ASEAN countries together with China, are claiming uh, areas of the Spratlys archipelago. Of course, these com competing claims uh, hopefully will not lead to uh, denying access to shipping, which I don't think it will. Well, it has never happened uh, except uh, during the Second World War when Correct. the one interdicting was the United States of America. Uh, and uh, of course, Japan on its uh, on the other end. Uh, but um, uh, what I find ironic is that uh, China, which is being accused of uh, aggressiveness, we see working with every ASEAN countries uh, on the basis of civilian development projects. But uh, in the uh, Balikatan, you see Goldberg, the ambassador, hand arm in arm with military. Uh, no? And so, who is milita militarizing the area? Uh, and that's my question. Well, again, uh, U.S. interests uh, all over the world basically is their commercial interests backed up by the full might and force of the U.S. military. It has been that way since the end of the Second World War, during the Cold War. But I think the United States has to learn how to adjust to the new realities uh, in the globe. Yeah. Well, so it's very ironic that they, they, uh, the, the party they accused to be uh, militarizing has so many civilian projects with the neighboring Asian states, while America's major project now is this alliance building on a military basis. Now, uh, it has led some on the uh, internet, uh, the Facebook, to say, well, the United States will fight for the freedom uh, of the region uh, to the last Filipino soldier. Well, again, <laughs> you, we are going back to those uh, post-Second World War, Cold War days. Uh, uh, that is finished. It ended uh, with the U.S. leaving Vietnam. Vietnam, and that was, that's one of the images we have in exactly. our in intro. And, uh, you know, and right after that, the U.S. opened relations with China mm -hmm. and wanted to bring China into the mainstream, which China did on its own terms. Well, okay, uh, we have many weeks uh, to come to discuss all these other issues stemming from this uh, crucial uh, 
21st century uh, development uh, between China and the U.S. Okay, let's go to the next uh, news item. Indonesia sinks vessels charged with illegal fishing. Indonesia sank 30 vessels charged with illegal fishing. It is known as the world's largest archipelagic nation that is pursuing a campaign against illegal fishing. The empty vessels from the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Myanmar were blown up at five separate locations across the country, as told by the fisheries minister Susi Pujiastuti. Four Indonesian boats were also sunk after they were all caught without proper documentation. Pujiastuti said the government is taking stronger and firmer action to enforce regulations to keep our waters safe. President Joko Widodo claimed that the practice of the sinking boats by Indonesia have cost the country's economy billions of dollars annually. The said campaign had caused tensions with other countries in the region. China expressed concern last year in line with their blown-up Chinese boats. Susi Pujiastuti, Maritime and Fisheries Minister, said that the policy had been carried out in five different locations this year, underlying that the implementation is aimed at deterring unauthorized vessels from exploiting the country's resources. 11 of 30 vessels were from Vietnam, 8 from Malaysia, 7 from the Philippines, and 4 from Indonesia. Pujia Stuti also acts as the commander of the Task Force on Illegal Fishing. According to him, illegal fishing on Indonesian waters had drastically decreased since the country started of its implementation and from October 2014, it is noted that Indonesia has sunk 151 ships, 50 from Vietnam, 40 from the Philippines, 21 from Thailand, 20 from Malaysia, 2 from Papua New Guinea, 1 from China, and 14 from Indonesia itself. Okay. Well, uh, Hero, recently we have read uh, very frequently about China's fishing boats uh, intruding into other waters. The impression in the Philippines and among many Filipinos is China is the big... Uh, uh, invader of fishing waters but as we see from the news and from Indonesia itself the greatest violator is Vietnam number one you know, followed by other countries and the Philippines too uh, but the lesson here I think is that uh, these are traditional fishing waters of all these countries that's a problem and uh, the only dialogue will solve this and fisheries agreements but, but only the Philippines uh, the Philippine government is not uh, engaged in dialogue uh, formal dialogue with China. That's a problem. I think uh, that problem, as far as the Philippine government is concerned, stems from the inability, which again, uh, this goes back to the capacity of the government to protect and defend our fishing resources. We do not have that capability that obviously the Indonesians have. Obviously, they do have a policy, and it is very, very strong as far as enforcement. You are caught, you are uh, let go, and the vessel is blown up. Obviously, they have been doing it for years, but unfortunately, our facilities, our capacities are limited. So, again, with this dispute in the Spratlys, the West Philippine Sea, China Sea issue, uh, perspectives uh, naturally when there is an issue with the Chinese boat or whatever will be blown up yeah. that hey and also we have to take our Filipino fishermen interest at heart yeah. uh, when they go out to fish and they are shooed away by the Chinese or the Vietnamese or even the Taiwanese we do not have the capabilities to defend them yeah but I think uh, none of these apprehension by the Indonesians uh, of fishing boats that violate their uh, uh, rules and regulations uh, encounter uh, physical violence. Uh, you, you know, oh. the other, except in the Philippines again, the Coast Guard uh, killing of a Taiwanese fisherman, you recall, around two years ago or three years ago. Uh, so uh, my point here is uh, there is an overreaction of many Filipinos to Chinese fishing incursions but the fact is the numbers show it it is not china that is the biggest problem all the countries are part of the problem 
and the other countries are bigger problems Again, and have bigger problems. Yeah. Our capabilities are very, very limited. Okay. I think we have time for the two more items in our news list uh, summaries for the past few months. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Marnie. Two heads of state meets. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi meets Ong San Suu Kyi in Myanmar as Beijing takes proactive approach towards the country's new government. The two foreign ministers met last April for about an hour in the country's capital. Su Chi said that Wang's visit was a fresh start of congeniality between the two nations. Added to that, she said, the relationship between their two countries socially and economically is very vital as they are neighbors. The talks came about as Chinese state-controlled commodity trader Guangdong Shenrong Energy won the approval from the Myanmar Investment Committee to build a three billion US dollar refinery in the southeast coastal city of Dawei in partnership with local parties. The refinery will have a capacity of 100,000 barrels per day. Despite the goodwill gesture, analysts said that setbacks facing Chinese investments in Myanmar and the suspension of Chinese back projects remained as a thorny issue. The two sides must reach an agreement on how to deal with the projects. Failing to do so would affect China greatly and bring serious damage to bilateral relations. It was said by Li Shixing, a professor of Jinan University specializing in Myanmar affairs. State-run news agency Xinhua downplayed the suspension of the projects, saying they were no more than growing pains, which is inevitable to two no neighbors who share a long border of 2,200 kilometers. Okay, uh, so at least uh, the new government of Myanmar, which people expected to be too Western-oriented, does not have any problems with dialogue with China. No, uh, look, they are neighbors with China. They have been there longer than the West has been coming to Asia. Again, this issue of competition with Western financial interest coming into Myanmar, uh, Myanmar had better be very careful because when you have the multilaterals, there was an issue where you have the IFC. International Finance Corporation of, of the, the IFF. World Bank. Yeah, World in Bank yeah. Instead of financing development projects, they helped the Quark group of companies, Shangri-La, open a five-star hotel in the capital of Myanmar for Western businessmen. So okay. What does that have to do with the development, development of a yeah. very poor country? I okay, mean, you know. we have one last item. We'll try to rush it through. It's between India and China. We can cut short the news uh, as short as possible so we can still comment. Please, uh, Marnie, go ahead. India and China can realize Asian century. India has unveiled an ambitious agenda to elevate its ties with China, with External Affairs Minister Shushma Swaraj announcing a six-point proposal to jointly realize with Beijing the dream of an Asian century. Ms. Swaraj said that the inaugural of the second India-China media forum, a six-point template can enrich the civilizations of India and China in the modern era. Listing out the proposals in alphabetical order, Ms. Swaraj stressed that the New Delhi-Beijing ties can reach the next level if both sides enforce an action, oriented approach, and a broad-based bilateral engagement. The visiting minister announced that on the boundary question, an irritant in the relationship that triggered the 1962 Sino-Indian War, she said, my government is committed to exploring an early settlement. Ms. Swaraj, who arrived in Beijing after a stopover in Kunming, one of the starting points of China's maritime Silk Road, and the Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar economic corridor, also observed that the foundation had been laid to take the Sino-Indian economic cooperation to a qualitatively new level. On its part, China acknowledged the Sino-Indian relations had entered a new period of major country relations. Jian Jiang Go, Minister of State Council Information Office, quoted from leader Deng Xiaoping as saying that, only when China and India have developed will a real century of Asia emerge. Okay, only if China and India are developed. India will be one of the best performers in the uh, coming year. I think over 7% GDP growth. We have a few seconds, so 
Uh, we'll just uh, continue later on our commentary. We'll take this break now.